Two years later, at the Notting Hill Carnival, a Caribbean festival uh, being held every year in Notting Hill, uh, there was uh, the police tried. There was another charge of the police against this huge black crowd, and the first of the big 70s riots erupted. Here you can see it also. Uh, sophisticated looking black women throwing rocks at the police. These are images from the Notting Hill uh, uh, riots in uh, July 1976. And these Notting Hill riots are interested, now I'm going to go on one of those weird uh, pop culture uh, tangents. These riots were, were very interesting because of one element. Uh, there were also a couple of, these are these, these three guys, four guys, uh, they're called The Clash. And they were then a very, very young, just having started out punk group, 1976. So it's just before, this hu before punk uh, really erupted. These guys, they, they lived in that area. Uh, they went to the Notting Hill Carnival. They were there when the police attacked, and they also took part in the riots. And you have to imagine, especially in, the, in this punk movement that tried to, that tried to do away with this whole uh, heritage of the 60s with uh, these uh, rock star millionaires that ha were now making uh, millions of dollars li uh, writing their songs at the edge of the swimming pool and uh, making th uh, double albums with 20 minute long drum solos, etc. They, had, they, had they, they were completely uh, fed up with that and they wanted to do something else. They wanted to make music that was just as ugly as the, as the, kind, as the streets that they lived in. They, want to make, they wanted to make music that was completely democratic that you didn't have to know how to play uh, an instrument for. They wanted to make music that was about equality, about direct action. Uh, they, they, were, they were at the same time um, informed by what had been going on with the punk music in Detroit that I talked about last time, uh, with Marxist theory, with black uh, rebels, uh, etc. So these guys, m half of them were completely middle class, they were, they were there in the riot, and then they s joined in with throwing rocks at the police and trying to turn over cars and setting them on fire. There's a very funny story by the singer of The Clash, the legendary Joe Strummer, who said that he saw all these black kids turning over cars and setting them on fire, and then he also wanted to set a car on fire, but he didn't know how. And he discovered that it's actually quite difficult to set a car on fire. And so all these guys were just throwing rocks as if they had done it all their lives and setting cars on fire. And he then discovered, I also want a riot. I want a riot of my own. I want a white riot. And White Riot became the very first single of The Clash and became, made, them, uh, made their name, made them famous. Uh, and this is, for, this is the... Uh, this is the, uh, the cover of their first single, single, The Clash, White Riot. They're being er and where did, where did they get this imagery? They got it from this uh, album by a huge reggae star, also from Jamaica and from Brixton in, uh, uh, in, in England. So you can see this interesting combination not just in behavior, but also in frustration, but e and, and thereby, uh, thereby uh, translated even into taking over the visual style and the graphic style of the reggae music that was being played and being heard in these dangerous black areas in London all the time. The white punks uh, heard this music, wanted to emulate it, wanted to take it over. So, there's a, so they, they, they were looking at... They, they didn't want to look at Beatles or Rolling Stones or Jimi Hendrix album covers anymore or listen to that music. They, they felt much more um, 
how do you say, addressed much more at home, much more provoked in a positive, inspired uh, by this uh, Rasta music, this reggae music that was coming out of the ghettos of uh, South and North London. So this is a di so you can see how, how in, in what a direct, nearly cartoon cartoonesque way they took over the uh, these things. And from then on, they, when they played on stage, because the, the Clash was an incredibly interesting band, because they first they also tried to merge their music for, with, with this kind of white, very fast, very stupid uh, white punk music and to merge it with reggae music, but also to merge their visual styles of the, you know, the, the, the safety pins, the ripped clothes, with uh, graphic design and visual images that they got from the reggae scene. And they merged that also with a nearly proper, with an extremely sophisticated propaganda-like uh, design of their, uh, of their concerts. So while they were playing this, this, this uh, war music, as they called it, they constantly projected uh, moving images of the riots that were going on on the streets of London. So you can see here that aesthetics, graphic design, music, politics, all came together in this, in this extremely interesting and paradoxical uh, punk culture of the late 70s and early 80s. Here, for example, the, the, the combination of, of ripped uh, paper aesthetics and this, and this uh, thrown on very, very, um, how do you say, uh, very rough uh, kind of a ty typography was in a way a combination of of modernist European uh, design plus uh, reggae albums from uh, Jamaica. Your big youth screaming target was a huge uh, graphic influence. And then there was even another thing that they, uh, these, punk, uh, uh, the, these punk ideologues, what the Clash actually were. This is a famous, this is a t-shirt made famous by the Clash. Uh, Joe Strummer wore it in the late 70s all the time. And it's a t-shirt in which he more or less expresses his solidarity with the, um, with the uh, radical left-wing terrorist groups that were then coming up in Germany and Italy. So you have the RAF, the Rote Armee Fraktion, the, with, their, uh, with their machine guns. So these guys were left-wing intellectuals uh, from uh, Western Germany who rebelled against uh, the system of, of, uh, of Germany in the 60s and 70s that they considered to be uh, kind of still Nazi, but then in a pseudo-democratic pseudo capitalist uh, disguise. And, and the same thing with the Brigate Rosse that Joe Sturmer spelt wrongly. Uh, uh, the, the, the Red Brigades, which was a similar radical left-wing intellectual group from Italy uh, that also uh, committed bombings, assassinations, and, uh, and also then disappeared into jail or were killed. Uh, so this punk movement took its inspirations from nearly everywhere and created a kind of uh, anti-60s, anti-hippie anti, um, um, aesthetics where in black, re black, rebel, black rebel music, European Marxist radical left-wing ideology and a kind of general working class uh, uh, street violence uh, all came together. This was really carried through, th through their entire uh, as marketing, which would, of course would, would be a word that they would not uh, agree with. This is, one of their first, uh, uh, this is one of their very early albums in which they use this image of this Rasta man walking towards this uh, barrier of, of riot police. And of course, they, these four white punks, identify with a Rasta man. Uh, for people who know our website, 
of my, the chair designers politics now immediately see the, uh, the roots of our own graphic uh, style. This is Paul Simonon, and one more thing about Paul Simonon was uh, the, the bass player of The Clash, and he grew up in the area called Brixton. And what is really interesting and what really made, because otherwise these guys would have been at a riot, wrote a song about it, be famous for 15 minutes and that would be it. But it developed further. Uh, Paul Simonon grew up in Brixton, and Brixton was one of the areas one of these black uh, areas, very poor, uh, in, in South London. He grew up there. He had always heard uh, the music of, uh, of the West Indians, uh, heard it around his, uh, in his streets, in his room, etc. He grew up around them. For this, is a, this is an album cover of a reggae album, for example, of the late 60s already, which is about Brixton Cat, and she was a a reggae singer, a Jamaican reggae singer from Brixton. So already in the late 60s, when Paul Simonon was like 12, uh, there was already this, this real cultural uh, reggae identity of this part of London. This, this is, for example, also uh, the album Struggling Man by Jimmy Cliff, another reggae singer. And uh, interesting of this album cover is the, the precision and the kind of kind of journalistic way in which the life on the street was being pictured. And it was a completely different idea of the street, of street life, than the British would have known. And it was a combination of, you, you can also see it in, the, in this image, that on the one side, there's loads of people there, there's going on, but on the, on the, at the same time you can also see this kind of idea of depression. Everybody's looking very sad, etc. Why? Because this whole idea of Rasta is, they, is an idea of, it's very much inspired by um, the story of the Israelites who were, who were uh, imprisoned by the Pharaoh. So the black people, the, the whole Rastafari religion, which is a strange mix of African and Christian uh, beliefs, is based on the fact that the Rastafari is a kind of tribe of black people that call themselves Israelites and that they are locked up and they are in the kind of locked away in, in, uh, as, uh, in ghettos in Babylon and Babylon is us. It's the white, uh, it's the white capitalist, democrat, uh, pseudo-democratic, uh, uh, racist, uh, imperialist wor world. So this whole idea that uh, the, the, the whole reggae idea is of black people having their own culture, which is a culture of exile inside Babylon. Um, so as a white kid growing up inside a black uh, ghetto, inside the white empire, it inspired young Paul Simonon to write a song for the clash called Guns of Brixton. And Guns of Brixton came out in 1980, and it is a song about imagine what it does to you when you are being harassed by the police all the time, when they kick in your front door. Uh, it's, you, should, you should Google it. It's, one of, it's a really uh, impressive kind of paranoid song. It, it's, it's a kind of wh white punk version of reggae, and it talks about the paranoia, the rising fear, the rising frustration, and, the, uh, and the, the, the danger of becoming violent. He literally sings, when they kick in your front door, how are you going to come with your hands on your head or, your thing or, your, or on the trigger of your gun? So he asks the question, what are we going to do now? Are we still going to accept this or are we going to shoot back? And just like Junior Delgado, uh, four years later, months after this song came out, here, uh, months after this song came out, they did come out, and they did come out with their hands on the triggers of their guns. And then the biggest race riot in uh, British history uh, broke out, the Brixton riots of 1981. So what you see here is again this strange, 